this guy was as cold and calculated as they come, maybe we weren't going to get it solved. It was like the epitome of innocence that had been preyed upon. This is a case that has no evidence. We didn't have DNA. We didn't have fingerprints. Step inside the court of law with the new true crime podcast, American Justice. We realize we have four men who answered the same ad for a job on a farm. My brother Ralph went to interview and he was never seen again. A podcast that explores impactful crimes and reveals how our justice system works. You have to consider that there are more possibilities than one. And sometimes how it doesn't. We have to find whoever this monster is. Go in depth into chilling cases and their conclusions in this new true crime series. You just have a pit in your stomach thinking, how many people are we going to find? New episodes of American Justice are available every Wednesday, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, this is the real-life story that inspired the horror classic, The Exorcism of Emily Rose, Annalise Michelle, the girl who was exorcised 67 times, but was she also murdered? Everybody and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my demon-haunted co-host, Alice. Brett, I really hope not. <laughs> I think everybody <laughs> knows <laughs> that is the scariest thing ever to me. I hope not, and you know what? I'm really conflicted, because obviously today we're talking about an exorcism. Have I told you my story about exorcism? Is Holy this where Water? you tell us that you have been the subject of an exorcism i have not been the subject (laughs) of an exorcism i hope never to be but i have i told i can't you know the stories start running together after four years of doing a podcast together have i told you my exorcism holy water story on this (laughs) podcast you know i don't think so but even if you did this is the perfect time to retell this is the perfect time to do it i'm sorry if if you're getting a repeat okay so there is holy water that is blessed specifically for exorcism, right? I didn't know this. This is new information to me. And so <laughs> there was some at the church. And I immediately texted Brett. I was like, guess what? This was like right after we did an interview with Ryan Bethay on Exorcism Files. Great podcast. Y'all should listen to it. A lot of you have listened to it. Those are like real exorcism stories. Great podcast. So we had just done this podcast. I'm freaking out because I think my electricity turned off in the middle of the interview. And I'm like, what is happening? I'm scared. It really did. And then I get this like email that was like, come pick up your exorcism, holy water. And I was like, say what? (laughs) So I text Brett and I was like, there's exorcism, holy water. You want some? He was like, you stay away with your exorcism water. Yeah, you never brought me any. I'm about to tell you why I didn't bring you Mm, any. Okay. So- I go pick up two bottles of exorcism holy water because, duh, of course I want some. (laughs) If there are demons here, I'm going to, I don't know, spray water on them. So I get two two bottles, right? And like literally it's labeled with like how they're blessed. And like you you put them aside. I, I really did get a bottle for you. This is not a joke. I got one bottle for me and one bottle for you. I was like, Brett's gonna love this. This is like the best birthday present ever. And then, so baby Brittany wakes up from a nap and, you know, her brothers love her, which is wonderful. And they all try to be the first to get to her in her crib. So she's like calling out. She's awake from her nap. And before I can get to her, son number two, we also call him Squanto because of his deep affection for Squanto and eating with a wooden spoon because Squanto did. He runs into her room and he's like talking to her. I hear him through the monitor. I'm like, oh, this is so sweet. I take my time. I go up there. And when I walk in, he is dousing her, squeezing the entire bottle of exorcism water all over her like baptism by literal holy water down her head and she's like being waterboarded she's like and i was like 
buddy, what are you doing? He goes, I'm making sure there are no demons in her. He has a terrible, he has a terrible wisp, terrible wisp. I'm making sure there are no demons in her. And I was like, so loving, please stop waterboarding your sister. And also that was Brett's bottle of holy water. That, That's okay, all. That is that hilarious. Is all. You did not tell me that story. As long as the baby's head didn't yeah. start like spinning around or anything when you did that, they're probably good. I mean, look, it's you never know, right? But that is the. I so think I have Squanto the empty was bottle. taking some. I've been around <laughs> I enough keep babies. Listening to Exorcist files. There are times when you're around babies and it's like, are you possessed by a demon? I mean, absolutely. I agree. Happens, so. I agree. Anyways, that's Anyways. my real life story of exorcism, holy water, and why you don't have a bottle. And that is probably the last happy thought we're gonna have. I mean, that was a nice, happy. Happy thing. If if you want to just end on a cloud, we'll see you next week. Because once we start talking about this story, <laughs> that's just such is, a sad story. It is dark and it is sad. It is. It's an interesting story in a lot of different ways. Criminal law perspective, from a religious perspective, matter of faith. As we talked about, if you believe in exorcisms, is this a legitimate exorcism or was it a terrible mistake? And we're going to talk about that as we go through this. As we noted in the the cold intro. The exorcism of Emily Rose was based on this movie or on this event, this real life event. So obviously we'll be watching the exorcism of Emily Rose this week. I hope you join us. By this point, we will have formed a public Halloween movie watching place on Facebook. So go to that if you want to watch with us and we'll have a great time. We always have a great time watching movies and we want as many of you to attend as possible. But with that, Let's talk about the story in case you haven't seen the movie or you have no idea what we're talking about. And, and I'll say this, after you listen to us, if this fascinates you, pretty much every podcast that delves into the sort of strange, dark, and mysterious, as Mr. Ballin would say, has covered this case at some point. So there's plenty of other things you can listen to. I, I was looking for a good book on it, and there is one, but it was only available in paperback and I didn't really want to get a paperback, so I didn't actually read it. Sorry. But, you know, there's not as much literature on this as I would like, but there's a lot of podcasts you can listen to, so definitely check those out. So The Exorcism of Emily Rose was released in 2005, and it quickly became a cult favorite in the horror genre. It is a terrifying movie that follows a defense attorney. It's a legal movie. It's like the My Cousin Vinny of Demons, basically. And it follows this defense attorney who's representing a local priest who's being tried for negligent homicide as the result of an exorcism that he performed. But before there was Emily Rose, there was Annalise Michelle, the real-life inspiration behind the film. Sometimes you, you hear this pronounced Annalise Michelle. She is German. It's possible that's right. We're going with Michelle, so live with it. So Annalise Michelle was born September 21st, 1952, in Lifling, Germany. That's certainly not how you pronounce that. Sorry, Lifling. I, th- I was just about to say, well, I didn't know that's how you pronounce it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> to parents Joseph and Anna Michelle. So I guess that's where Annalise Michelle comes from. She and her sisters grew up in a profoundly religious Catholic household. Her mother was incredibly devout. And she was very strict with all of her daughters. Annalise was, by all accounts, a beautiful and healthy baby girl. But it wasn't long until a series of health issues struck young Annalise. By the age of five, she had contracted mumps, measles, and scarlet fever, and was generally regarded as a delicate child. At age 16, Annalise would receive an epilepsy diagnosis that would change the course of her short life. When medical interventions didn't help ease her symptoms, Annalise and her family would turn to the church for answers. The result? A series of exorcisms so intense, they may have cost Annalise her life. And I think we're already seeing where the problems are going to come in in this case. We've done an exorcism case before. It was a young boy. Obviously, we've talked about the exorcist files. We've talked to Ryan Bethay, who's the host of that show. And when we talked to Ryan, one of the things he talked about was how the Catholic Church takes a lot of steps to ensure that this is not some sort of standard medical issue before going into the exorcism. Because there's recognition that if this is just some sort of standard 
medical issue that maybe people don't understand or is not well understood, that you can do a lot of harm by treating it as sort of a religious affliction and not a physical one. And you can already see with Annalise that we're setting up for a problem here because her problems initially seem like they're pretty physical. When we did the exorcism of Roland Doe, how did that start? It didn't start with him being sick or anything like that. There was nothing like that. It started with him and his grandmother, I think it was his grandmother, getting out the Ouija board and playing around with the Ouija board and contacting spirits and all this other stuff. That's how it started. With Annalise, it starts with measles. It starts with scarlet fever, which I had when I was a kid. And I did not know that was a 21st or 20th century, late 20th century thing that people got, to be totally honest. You can still honest. get it. You can still get it. It's just now you take the antibiotics and you're fine. It was like, you know, I think you told a story once about your son. Basically, I woke up one day and I couldn't walk. And they oh. were like, well, that's not good. So they <laughs> took me to the doctor and it turned out I had scarlet fever. So then they, they did the, the magic of modern Gosh. medicine, and I was fine. But anyways, so she, she has these very real diseases, these very real medical issues, and then they lead to epilepsy, which if you've ever been around somebody with epilepsy, it can be pretty horrific when someone has a seizure. I mean, it can look like something otherworldly is going on. And so you can already see how this is building towards what's going to eventually happen. Another thing that is really going to come into this as well is parents and how they want to do everything for their children. And when do you cross the line of just being a parent trying to seek the best for your child into something that goes into the criminal realm world? So I think these are really interesting questions that we grapple with in lots of different contexts even today. But here we have parents who seemingly are loving parents. They have other children as well. They're seeking medical care, but it seems like maybe medicine is not giving them the answers they are seeking for their daughter. And she continues to suffer. And anyone who has, you know, anyone they love, dogs, pets, kids, when your loved one is ill, you would do anything to help them. But when is that anything going into the realm of criminal conduct? So this starts in September 1968. Annalise was 16 years old, and she experienced her first incident that would later be characterized as a demonic possession. And look, I know a lot of you out there, you don't believe in exorcisms, you don't believe in demonic possession, you don't believe in any of that kind of stuff, and that's fine. I hope you enjoy the story, listen to it, whatever. But if you do, if you're someone who does believe that there can be demonic possessions and there can be exorcisms, then one thing you can think about, and I think we've already telegraphed that this is one of the things we're doing, is is this really a demonic possession or is it some sort of medical event? And this is the first thing that's going to be pointed to later on as evidence of demonic possession. So out of the blue one day, she loses consciousness while she's in school. Later that same day, she wakes up in the middle of the night and she's paralyzed. She lost control of her bladder and reported that she had difficulty breathing like there was something heavy pressing on her chest. She also had a sore tongue. Now I will say, this sounds to me like a night terror. This happens to a lot of people. There's Sometimes it's called old hag syndrome. Those of you who've ever seen one of the most terrifying, it's a documentary, but it might as well be a horror movie. I think it's called Nightmare. And it is a documentary about people who have sleep terrors and the things they see and the things they experience. And they experience things like the hat man. <laughs> so they see a man standing over them he's all black and he's wearing a hat and this is like a common thing that people say different people around the world report the same experience and according to scientists at least this is just sort of a common psychological thing that happens to some people who experience night terrors they will feel this they will wake up and they experience sleep paralysis they can't move they feel like something's on their chest they're seeing things that aren't necessarily there. And that's what sounds like is going on here. Now, this episode was short-lived, and it didn't require any kind of medical intervention. In fact, Annalise would all but forget about this for nearly a year. Now, this takes us to August 24th, 1969. One summer afternoon, Annalise lost consciousness again, and this was coupled with paralysis later in the evening. The next morning, she went to see her family doctor who recommended that she follow up with a neurologist since 
She had lost consciousness. Paralysis is coming about again. A few days later, on August 27th, 1969, Annalise had an appointment with neurologist Dr. Siegfried Luthi. He performed an EEG, which showed normal brain activity, nothing out of the ordinary. But he did diagnose her with cerebral seizures with symptoms of grand mal epilepsy, but did not prescribe any medications to help. Not long after this appointment, Annalise developed a severe sore throat, which resulted in her getting her tonsils removed. She then developed pleurisy and pneumonia, which was made worse by tuberculosis infection. I mean, oh, poor girl, right? I'm no doctor, but obviously, Whenever you have big medical events that lead to something like paralysis or you have seizures, at the very least, we have this neurologist who's diagnosing her with pretty serious diagnoses, cerebral seizures, something to do with the brain. It takes a toll on the body. I blessedly have never had a seizure, but having seen people go through seizures, it's a very traumatic and physically exhausting event for the body. And when your body's exhausted, your immune system can be diminished. So it's not really surprising that having kind of back-to-back probably seizures, then leading to paralysis, that her immune system is probably compromised, which probably led to just normal illnesses that maybe she'd be able to fight off regularly. But the fact that they're all happening in quick succession, her body is kind of depleted of energy. And you're already seeing in this short, short amount of time, she is going through a lot of physical trauma. Now, why the neurologist didn't prescribe any medication? I'm not sure. I don't know if they had the right medications there. But it seems that She certainly went to him because she needed help. And instead she got her tonsils out, which may have been needed at the time. But then we're talking about like bacterial infections, things that can affect anyone. But I think compounded with the other neurological symptoms that she was having was a big toll. And I think probably today the medical treatment that would be prescribed to her It'd be quite different from what we're seeing. I mean, look, it's kind of remarkable how far medicine came in about 100 years. And if you think about it, there were no antibiotics really before World War II. I mean, they had been invented, but they didn't become commonplace. They weren't really accepted. We're still using some older techniques. Even worse when it comes to neurology. When it comes to anything dealing with the brain, we just, I mean... Essentially, through the mid-20th century, we're living in the Stone Ages. I mean, this is about 1970, so we're, we're moving away from it at that point. But one of the main treatments for any kind of neuroses at the time was a lobotomy, transorbital lobotomy, where essentially you take a ice pick, literally, and a hammer, and you put the ice pick right at the top of your nose, in the orbit of your eye, and you hammer into the brain. The bone there is is pretty brittle, so it's easy to hammer through. You move the ice pick around a little bit to sever some of the frontal cortex from the rest of the brain, and that's lobotomy. And we use that to treat all sorts of things, including epilepsy, a lot of other issues, all the way up to the late 1960s. And this was a treatment that was performed on... Everyone from children all the way to elderly adults. This was the kind of thing that we were engaged in. I don't know what kind of treatments, chemical treatments, drugs, they actually would even had at this point in 1970 in Germany. It's hard to say. So I think when you read it, you're like, this is wild. Why aren't they doing anything for this girl? But I think you do have to put yourself back then a little bit and in the shoes of the people then, and see that maybe there just wasn't a whole lot available. And as Alice said, I mean, it's just a cascade of things are happening to her. She's had the measles. She's had scarlet fever. Now she's got pneumonia. She's got pleurisy, which is fluid on the lungs, and tuberculosis. This is awful. And she's going through all this stuff while she's also experiencing these worsening mental health issues. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Guys, You know how much I love October. It is the season for wearing masks and costumes, and we have a lot of fun doing it. But unfortunately, too many of us feel like we have to wear a mask all year long, and we're hiding something that we want to do or someone we want to be, whether it's at work 
or in social settings, or around our family. Well, therapy can help you learn to accept all parts of yourself so you can take off the mask, because masks should be for Halloween fun, not for emotions. And if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. You just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. We can really all benefit from therapy. It doesn't just have to be some big life event. We can all learn broader benefits of coping skills and setting those boundaries. So take off the mask with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash prosecutors today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp. H-E-L-P dot com slash prosecutors. Guys, the OG is back. One of our favorite sponsors, HelloFresh. You've heard us talk about them before. You know what they do. You can use them to make this fall the tastiest season yet with farm fresh produce and easy autumn inspired recipes delivered right to your door with HelloFresh. HelloFresh delivers all the pre-portioned ingredients you'll need to make easy homemade meals. All the proteins, veggies, sauces, spices, and more arrive in your box, along with simple instructions that walk you through each step in the cooking process. Whip up tasty restaurant-style meals in your own kitchen without the high price tag of takeout, and in less time than it takes to get delivery. HelloFresh has tons of options for what you're craving. You can choose from a changing menu of over 50 recipes each week, plus take your pick from over 100 market add-on items like desserts, breakfast, and snacks. And in fact, HelloFresh is so good that it recently was mentioned in a Supreme Court argument. I kid you not. It truly was. And guys, you can't make this up. Today was a busy work day, as always. I was working furiously as the end of the day was coming to a close, and I got a call from a neighbor who really needed to come over with her kids because she just had like a disaster at home, and they came right around dinner time. And would you believe it? At that moment that she came in the door, the delivery man brought in my HelloFresh box. And my poor neighbor said, I'm so sorry. It's dinner time. I know there's no food for us. We'll go get takeout. And I said, actually, I have HelloFresh. I made the Peruvian chicken. Everyone was so happy. All the kids were eating. Everyone was happy. I didn't have to stress about making a meal for surprise guests. And I am so happy. Everyone was fed. Go get 10 free meals at HelloFresh.com slash free prosecutors. Applied across seven boxes. New subscribers only varies by plan. That's 10 free HelloFresh meals just by going to HelloFresh.com slash free prosecutors. And find out for yourself why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. Guys, we want to talk about a podcast that needs no introduction because it's one that we've appeared on several times. And... We love Silver Linings Handbook. We love Jason Blair. We love the work that he does. He is one of the best interviewers in the business. He has interviewed a lot of people from both the true crime space and really across the spectrum. And he always manages to get the very best points out of them. He talks about he wants to do a podcast with conversations that inspire, and that's what he does every single episode. I hope you guys will check it out. It is amazing. We love not only appearing on it, but we love listening to it, and you will too. Absolutely. You will get so much out of his very interesting conversations with interesting people. The areas he's focused on have included well-being, mental health, the long criminal justice system, true crime, religion, society, culture, people who are underrepresented in the mainstream media, such as racial minorities, indigenous people, and LGBT. BTQ people. In other words, there is something for everyone. And what we feel makes this podcast different is that it's truly not scripted. We can say that having appeared on it before, because Jason uses the same natural curiosity you have listening in your living room or around a campfire with a new and exciting person you have just met. Jason's a former journalist who worked at the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Washington Post, and other newspapers. And the podcast is one of several comebacks from a 2003 scandal that he was part of at the times that led him to start working in mental health. And his vulnerability around this has been so refreshing that we can all learn from. So subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. 
one thing to note about I, it it just came to mind when you were describing the things that she's going through they have to do with the lungs which have to do with getting enough oxygen to the brain and the rest of the body part of the problem with seizures is the lack of oxygen to the brain for a period of time and then also with kind of respiratory issues pleurisy with pneumonia lack of oxygen to the brain can sometimes lead to additional things like hallucinations or not being able to think straight we're going to talk more about what's happening to her but this is i think this is all connected and that you have to kind of see the whole environment that's happening right now by the way i just looked it up they were still doing lobotomies in france in the 1980s technically there are still lobotomies today right like they don't call them lobotomies but there are situations where there can be such intense activity in the brain that literally doctors don't know what to do so they remove a portion of it they no longer call it a lobotomy because people think of the ice pick but i think that you there are still instances where we do that today there are certain surgeries you can do to the brain that do involve separating portions of the brain including at times cutting the middle of the brain so the two lobes of the brain are no longer connected thorazine which is called a chemical lobotomy has basically replaced the standard lobotomy the one that was used on Tens of thousands of people for things much less serious than severe epilepsy, including things like depression. You'd be lobotomized because you were depressed. Or, you know, there were children who were lobotomized because they were too energetic. They were their parents couldn't control them. So they lobotomized them. It was a dark period of time. And I'm only saying this not because she is going to have a lobotomy, but because that is sort of the state of medicine at this time when you're dealing with these mental health issues. So let's fast forward to February 28th, 1970. So by this point, Annalise's illness, she's confined to bed by various things, including some pretty serious issues with her lungs. On February 28th, she is admitted to a clinic in Middleburg, which specializes in treating lung diseases. While there, she's diagnosed with heart and circulatory problems. So just to add to the issues, all the infections, She's having epilepsy. She has lung problems. Now she's having heart and circulatory problems. During her time at the clinic, she would report that she began seeing Fratzen, which translates from German to English as grimaces. Now she would describe what she was seeing as these ghastly demonic faces. And she said she began feeling empty, as though the devil were inside of her. And these visions would be accompanied by foul-smelling odors, which she sometimes likened to burning fecal matter. Now, she began to have more and more serious seizures in addition to everything else she was having. And the more seizures she would have, the more visions of these grimaces she would also see. She said they began speaking to her, telling her that she was damned to hell. And everything that she's experiencing physically, I can see how that does feel in a way like a hell on earth. So these physical ailments, mental ailments are really taking a grip on her and they are not releasing. In June of 1970, Annalise experienced her third episode of blackouts followed by paralysis. She was taken to a different neurologist who also performed an EEG, but this time the test revealed a series of irregularities. Remember previously it seemed to show normal brain activity? Not this time. This doctor observed irregular alpha wave patterns as well as scattered delta and theta waves in Annalise's brain. He prescribed her an anticonvulsant medication, officially beginning her treatment for epilepsy. So she is prescribed medicine this time. I don't really know what delta and theta waves are. They sound like something, but I, I'm not stuff. sure. Yeah. Brain stuff. I think the whole point here is in a relatively short amount of time, what are we looking at? And basically a year, she goes from having a normal EEG with no medication for epilepsy to a year later where another doctor, who knows if the same doctor would have had the same diagnosis, but different doctor, looks at the EEG and says, no, there are irregular patterns in her brain and then starts treating her for that epilepsy. So on August 29th, 1970, remember this started back in February, this stay in the hospital. After all that time, around six months in the hospital, she's finally able to return home. Now, she went to Middleburg to treat her lungs and all the issues she was having with her lungs. And they may have succeeded there, but the whole stay had a big impact on her mental health. 
She'd been away from her home. She was isolated from other patients because, remember, she has tuberculosis. Highly contagious. Tuberculosis has killed more humans. I'm going to say this, and someone can prove me wrong. Tuberculosis has killed more humans over the history of the world than any other disease. I think it's like one in seven people who've ever lived died of tuberculosis or something like that. That's probably wrong, but it's something like that. It's like really high. It's very contagious and can be treated with antibiotics, though the antibiotics work less and less frequently than they used to. And it seems like everybody used to die of tuberculosis. So the fact that she has that means she's going to be isolated. They're not going to let her hang out with other patients. She's not seeing these other patients. And because of her issues, remember, she's having these weird mental health issues. She's saying strange things, things that kind of freak people out. And so the people who are around her are often mocking her, calling her crazy. They're being cruel to her. She has no friends. And she became depressed. She withdraws. And her disposition, you remember, she had been this bright, sunny person before all these horrible things started happening to her. That fades away. Now, what she does, like many people do when you're in a dark place like this, she turns to her religion to help her. But recall, while she's turning to her religion, there are these problems that she has that haven't gone away. Fast forward about three years to around March or April 1973. Annalise begins hearing noises in her room, noises that no one else could hear. She would say that she would awake in the middle of the night by the distinct sound of knocking. Now we're getting into the fairly common things you see with demonic possession. Knocking is typically one of the first things you see. They take her to see a doctor, and the doctor says... Don't know what's going on, but I can tell you, your hearing's fine. So don't know why you're hearing these things and don't know why nobody else is. But the one thing I can say for certain, everything else about you might be messed up. You got great hearing. So it was sometime in 1973, the fall, that Annalise and those around her began to consider the idea that she might be suffering from something more than just physical ailments. They began to think that maybe she had demonic possessions. Father Ernst Dalt shared this belief, and Annalise began taking solace in conversations with him. For one, you can imagine it's been almost three or four years, really back to her childhood, if you want to talk about the delicacy of her physical composition. Finally, it seems like someone is giving her answers, something that is not her fault. It's not just because she's a delicate child. You can almost feel her breath of relief that this father is telling her, Maybe it's demonic possessions. That's out of your control. And he becomes Annalisa's spiritual advisor by the fall of 1973. Now, at the same time, her doctor reported that Annalise became incapable of making decisions for herself, causing some concern that maybe these priests she was talking to were influencing her too much. And look, I think another fascinating aspect of this case is the effect of confirmation bias and how one person's belief can affect another person, particularly if that person already has mental health issues. Possibly Annalise Michelle is possessed, and maybe this priest is just recognizing this, but he's coming in a little late in the game. We've talked about a lot of the things that have happened up to this point. And you have Annalise, who she's had all these issues, She's been depressed. She's been hopeless. She's turned to her religion. She's poured herself into that to try and find a way back to happiness, a way back to health. And now someone that she deeply respects, someone who is a leader in that religion, is telling her, hey, I think you might be possessed by a demon. You can imagine the effect that would have on her, particularly as Alice said, when it's someone who finally seems to be listening to her, who cares about her, who's paying attention to her, who's trying to help her. She hears this, and what effect is that going to have on her mental state going forward? Now, again, I do not claim to be and hope I'm never an expert in exorcisms, but we just happen to have a lot of conversations with people who know a lot about exorcisms and exorcisms. So that I will say this part of the story jumped out at me immediately. Because what we learn from the podcast Exorcist Files, the case of Roland Doe, where we read through all of the priests' very detailed notes that they were required to keep about the exorcism, which were, by the way, like anonymized, so we didn't even know who they were about. Just in reading kind of the records of other exorcisms that came from the church, 
immediately this seemed to stick out because it seemed like one priest acting alone in a way that didn't seem to have the structures in place that we've read in the other exorcisms that were meant to protect not only the subject of the possession, who would be Annalise in this case, but also the priests. One thing I remember from our Roland Doe episode was that these priests could never do anything alone, right? Because these demons are pretty powerful. It was like to protect them. They could never do exorcisms alone. They never spoke to demon possessed alone. They had like meetings and confirmations from other priests before they took action. Here we're seeing kind of this one-on-one -on -one conversation, which I think in a normal counseling situation would be fine, but nothing about Annalisa's situation is normal. And it's interesting that her doctor is kind of one of the first people to raise alarms and say, okay, something has changed about your demeanor as well. Yes, you have a lot of problems that we've been dealing with in the past, but a very marked change now is your seeming inability to think for yourself. And it coincides with you speaking with this one priest. So around this time as well, she developed an intolerance of sacred objects. Now, this is also very common of the demon possessed, right? They don't like things like holy water and crucifixes. We've watched movies about it. You make the sign of the cross and the person possessed, you know, shies away and screeches in pain. So this does seem to fall kind of within the category of what we typically see as demon possessed. But again, what we've talked about is Annalise is in a very sensitive time in her life. She's very impressionable. It's not that she first develops these aversions to holy objects or sacred objects. And then someone looking at her says, huh, she's developed these things. She's hearing things. She's developed an aversion. This seems to point to demon possession. Rather, it's like she's given the diagnosis first. And then she begins to develop these symptoms that fall in line with the diagnosis that might actually bring her a lot of relief. So note the timeline of events of when these things happen as well. And I think one thing that's interesting to note, when we talked to Ryan in Exorcist Files, he actually talked about how these signs are the ones that the exorcist discount largely because they are so easy to fake, even if you don't mean to fake them. You know, it's, it's easy to believe that, you know, you can't be near a cross, right? I mean, it's easy for that to happen. That's not sort of a testable physical manifestation. There was one incident in 1973 where Annalise traveled to San Damiano, a church monastery in northern Italy. And when she got there, Annalise claimed that she was unable to enter the shrine, stating that, quote, the earth beneath her burned. She also claimed that it pained her to look at the holy pictures and sacramentals present. Again, I want to note when these develop. They didn't first develop and then she was diagnosed. Again, kind of like with the crucifix thing, you can imagine if you think there's a demon possession, there are certain things that I could never having stepped foot in a church or in a monastery before, you probably could be like, yeah, you probably don't want to like to look at holy objects. You probably don't want to step inside a shrine. You probably don't want to be in places of worship for a God that is opposite the demon that you think is possessing you. So this is all very interesting that she's saying these things herself. Now on the way home from that trip, her voice changed, becoming deeper and more masculine. She also began omitting a strong, foul odor that even other people on the bus reported. Remember, she, at the very beginning of all these hallucinations, said that she saw frats and grimaces and she smelled foul things. But that was just to her. Now, other people are beginning to smell things on her. She seems to be changing physically in ways that we can perceive, like her voice. Note also that there are infections and physical ailments that can lead to foul smelling odor in a person that could be purely physical, especially if they're not being treated. So we don't know what is causing this, except that whatever is happening is no longer just in her head in terms of the foul odor. And after this particular incident, Annalise's parents began begging the church to perform an exorcism. At first, the church denied the request. Remember we talked about in past exorcism cases, there's a process in which the church wants to make sure this isn't a physical or a mental ailment that needs to be treated by doctors, that this really is a demon possession, because obviously you can do a lot of harm if you are trying to do an exorcism with someone who may just need antidepressants or, you know, some sort of anti 
epilepsy medicine. And this is really interesting. Parents are begging for it. Annalise is begging for it. The church says, no, no exorcism here. Because Annalise was already being treated for a medical condition and mental health conditions, the Catholic Church did not believe that an exorcism was appropriate. So lacking support from the church, Annalise's parents asked her doctors to switch her medication, hoping that it may lead to a positive change. Again, I do think her parents care very much about her. They're trying everything from the church to the doctors to seek answers for Annalise. But unfortunately, this new medication made no difference. And instead, Annalise's symptoms continued to ramp up. So in May of 1975, there are several stressors that are going to occur that are only going to make things worse. Number one, Annalise's grandmother, with whom she was very close, passed away. Her sister, who had been a supporter of hers, moved away to start a new job. And the stress of these events caused Annalise's condition to worsen. Step back into the picture, Father Ernst Alt. Now, he had wanted to have an exorcism for Annalise for a very long time. In September of 1975, he petitions the local bishop, Bishop Joseph Stengel, for permission to have an exorcism performed on Annalise. Now, recall, earlier, sort of the larger church structure had prevented there from being an exorcism. I think based on some pretty solid ground that there are prior medical issues that could very well be leading to this, Let's not be hasty. Kind of feels like Ernst did the whole thing where you ask mom for permission and she says no and then you go find dad. Feels like that's what he's doing. He basically finds the friendly local bishop who he knows and this has been going on for a while and he's like, look, it's getting worse. Medicine's not helping. Let me do this. And the bishop agrees to allow it to happen despite all of these other things going on and frankly feels like based on what we've learned in our discussions with other people and just looking at exorcisms, this was probably not the proper way to approve this. They probably needed to go through a little bit more structure before this exorcism is approved, but it is approved, and so he is going to move forward. And he gets another local priest, Father Arnold Rentz, who is going to help perform the exorcism with him. Interestingly, the bishop orders that this all be done in total secrecy. Now, on the one hand, that seems like he's trying to cover things up, but I will say this. We saw the same thing with Roland Doe. The, the priest and the church hierarchy involved didn't want Roland to be subjected to a lot of scrutiny and potential ridicule and all sorts of other things, and so they generally had a rule of silence about that case as well. So, this is often presented as he knew he shouldn't be doing this, and maybe that's what it is, but I don't think it's entirely inconsistent with what we've seen in other exorcisms. Yeah, I think that's right. Remember the Roland Doe records? It took like 50 years or more for them to be even unsealed, and then they were still anonymized as well. I think the problem here, interestingly, is that it seems like everyone around her is talking about the possession, including Annalise and her parents, right? And so there is the problem of if they were trying to protect her, it seems like people are talking about it. So this process that begins at this point is going to last for 10 months. Over that period of time, Annalise would endure 67 exorcisms. Sometimes these lasted up to four hours long. 42 of these sessions were actually audio recorded. Over the course of these exorcisms, it was revealed, take that with a grain of salt, that Annalise was being possessed by six demons. I'm going to give you the first five, and then I'll tell you about the last one. Lucifer, that would be Satan. Cain, who murdered his brother. Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. Adolf Hitler, who, I mean, you know, demon, I can see it. And Nero, who also, I mean, you got these, these, these guys, basically you got Satan himself and then people who did things that were so horrible that they also were demons too. Before you get to the last one, all people you've probably heard of, which is actually really interesting. If you remember back to our Roland Doe episode, the demons did reveal their names throughout the exorcisms, but they weren't people from history that you knew. They did have names, but it was not a name that you necessarily knew. Their identity was not necessarily known to them. And I mean, maybe Judas Iscariot and Adolf Hitler, like if I had to pick people who were probably with Satan, probably, but those just seem to be very famous names 
that whether or not you've ever opened a Bible, you've heard of their names at least. And I think that's very interesting here because there are supposedly lots of different types of demons. And this particular girl apparently has the attention of really all the famous like evil people I've ever heard of. Yeah. Apparently during the exorcisms, it comes to everybody's, all the other demons are making fun of Hitler. They say he talks too much and he has really no authority in hell. He's kind of a loser. So I, I thought that was funny. But yeah, yeah, you're right. It's kind of like whenever you see somebody who says they've been reincarnated, they never say like, yeah, I was a chimney sweep in 16th century London and I died when I fell off a roof and broke my neck. They're always like Cleopatra or Caesar you know, or George Washington. Like everybody who's ever been reincarnated in their previous life was someone incredibly famous. They're never just some rando. And I feel like you got this here. I mean, she's literally possessed by Lucifer himself. And as you mentioned, all these really famous, terrible people. Now, I will say this. The last of the demons cuts against that argument. Because the last of the demons is Fleischmann. You probably never heard of Fleischmann. Fleischmann was a 16th century Frankish priest who was defrocked for the crime of drinking too much and getting disorderly. So you got like, the worst of the worst. And then this guy who drank too much, he got in some fights. He might have accidentally killed somebody while he was drunk, and he got kicked out of the priesthood. I mean, not not that any of that's good, but it's just sort of, there's a stark difference between Fleischmann and these other five. Look, I'd be curious if Father Rents had studied Fleischmann in seminary, for example. It just seems uh, like a personal vendetta in some way. <laughs> like, Fleischmann? Gosh darn it. Fleischmann. It's always Fleischmann. Yeah, exactly. That would, that would be a really interesting You know what I mean? Like, I, I would be yeah. curious if like he had been given or he lived in the house of Fleischmann and then he was, def- you know, and he was mm-hmm. like, it was a, he, instead of getting to be in Gryffindor, like he got into the house of Fleischmann and it's yeah. always been this stain on his frock. So Annalise, we've talked about her voice deepening and these demons, when they would come out, they would speak through Annalise in these deep and guttural voices, much deeper than you would expect from her. And they would do sort of the typical things that demons do. They would criticize the church. They would ridicule the faithful. But they'd also ridicule the people who didn't believe, because that's pretty common, too, actually. And they would talk about their own power and how much power they had and how great they were and how they were dominating this girl and how the priests weren't going to be able to do anything about it. Now, according to the noted website, paranormalscholar.com, which I assume is absolutely 100% accurate. And that's the other problem with this. You know, with Roland Doe, that case was actually documented pretty well. And it was documented by these Jesuit priests who wrote everything down. They kept sort of meticulous notes about what happened and when it happened and what day it happened. With Annalise Michelle, the sort of details of her exorcism are a little fuzzy. Obviously, at the beginning, we have a bunch of things that she easily could have faked that could have been the result of her epilepsy. But this has developed into legend now. And so what you hear now, I'm going to talk about this. Some of this I think is definitely true. Some of it, I don't know if it's true or not. But it was said that she would speak in tongues, that she would spend whole days attacking family members, that she would have this unnatural strength, which are all things that you're supposed to have when you are possessed, that she would bark like a dog, that she would bite the head off of dead animals, that she would eat spiders, that she would drink her own urine, She would claim to be able to see all these demons in the room. There were invisible forces that were constantly throwing her around, slamming her into the wall. She was covered in bruises from head to toe. There would be times where she wouldn't eat anything at all. But then there would be other times where she would gorge herself on food to the point of sickness. But she's gradually losing weight and becoming emaciated. And there were claims of sort of poltergeist-like activity that chairs and tables and objects would move around on their own. And this is one of the most tragic things, which is definitely true, and this is documented. She spent so much time kneeling in prayer that her knees actually broke. But even though she had broken kneecaps, she would continue to do this despite the immense pain that it would cause her. You all know there is nothing I love more than fall in October. I love the leaves falling, the cozy evenings at home, Halloween, all of it. And you know what? 
The thing that makes it even better is a great bottle of wine. And that's why First Leaf has become my go-to for making sure I always have the perfect wine on hand for those cozy nights, watching movies, or sitting by the fire. You guys know that First Leaf has been a sponsor for a long time. Well, I'll tell you what, I am now a member. I love getting boxes of wine from all over the world curated perfectly to what I want because I'm able to go in and tell First Leaf what I liked about the last shipment and what I didn't, and they will use that information to ensure that I get exactly what I want, and it all gets delivered right to my door. And one of the best parts about First Leaf is how they let me control my delivery schedule. This may be surprising to some of you, but I don't always drink all the wine that I've gotten from First Leaf very quickly. So sometimes I'm like, you know what? I'm going to wait a month to get another box, and I can do that with First Leaf. I can choose exactly when my wine arrives, so I never have to worry about missing a delivery. It is super convenient. Guys, it's awesome to have First Leaf, which is your personalized wine club that knows my wine preferences better than I do. Plus, if I get a bottle that I don't absolutely love, it's not a problem because First Leaf has a 100% satisfaction guarantee. So get cozy and pop open that perfect bottle of wine from First Leaf. Go to tryfirstleaf.com slash prosecute to sign up and you'll get your first six hand-picked bottles for just $44.95. That's T-R-Y. F-I-R-S-T-L-E-A-F dot com slash prosecute. Try firstleaf dot com slash prosecute. This episode is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Hey guys, whether you love true crime or comedies, celebrity interviews, news, or even motivational speakers, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue, right? And guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance too. Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, then they'll show you a variety of coverages that fit within your budget, giving you options. Now that's something you'll want to press play on. It's easy to start a quote, and you'll be able to choose the best option for you fast. It's just one of the many ways you can save with Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com to try the Name Your Price tool for yourself and join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Oh, this is so sad and it's not going to get any better. On July 1st, 1976, Annalise Michelle died in her home and she was only 23 years old. In her final moments, she said to her mother, Mother, I'm afraid. Her cause of death was dehydration and malnutrition, with Annalise weighing just 68 pounds at the time of her death. Now, the German state of Bavaria launched an investigation into Annalise's death, and they believe that with the help of medical intervention, Annalise would have survived. I mean, when you have the cause of death being dehydration and malnutrition, rather than, say, one of her physical ailments, I can see why the investigation led to that conclusion. And they noted that Annalise suffered pneumonia shortly before her death, which her parents neglected to treat because they were so focused on the exorcisms. Ultimately, Annalise's parents, Joseph and Anna, Michelle, and the two priests, Father Rents and Alt, were all arrested and charged with negligent homicide. And this is where this becomes a really interesting legal question. Because, you know, you have these four people, her parents and the priest, who truly, deeply, without malice, believe that they're doing the right thing. That they, in fact, are doing the only thing that could possibly save Annalise's life. But despite that, she dies in their care. So what do you do about that? And the state is going to say, that's great that you thought you were doing the right thing, but we can't ignore the fact that she died and not only died, but died in this, in this horrific state, one that should have been preventable. And so they bring these charges. Now it took two years for this to go to trial. It began on March 30th, 1978, and it was a bit of a sensation, sort of an international story. The prosecution asserted that Annalise required medical attention and that both her parents and the two priests knew this, but they ignored it so they could continue with the exorcisms. And I'll say this, if you look at the pictures of her, I mean, before and after, it is clear that she is in 
dire straits. The fact that she only weighs 68 pounds, the fact that she's bruised, that she has these, these injuries, you can see how the prosecution is making this argument and doing a pretty good job with it. Now, a doctor testified and said that Annalise's hallucinations were likely the result of her epilepsy, which had been diagnosed and not demonic possession. The defense had sort of an interesting challenge to this. They said, look, nothing we did was illegal. Exorcisms were legal in Germany, and they believed there was sufficient evidence that Annalise was, in fact, possessed by demons. Or, alternatively, that there was enough evidence that her parents and the priest could sort of reasonably believe this and take the actions that they took. Now, both her parents and the priest testified. And they said that they tried medical interventions first, but they were unsuccessful in easing Annalise's symptoms. And I think this kind of goes back to the, the gorging herself. I mean, one of the things they would say is, look, there would be times where she would just eat tons of food, but she didn't gain any weight. So we didn't think whatever was happening to her, we thought was related to the demons, not to the fact she wasn't eating. Now, I think the reality of the situation was because of how she was eating, it was just making her sick and she wasn't getting a whole lot of nutrition out of that. And they should have probably recognized that. But that is going to be sort of their argument. Like, we were doing the best we could in a very difficult situation. Which is interesting, right? Like, we don't have this documented abusive childhood. We really do have parents, I think, who were taking her from doctor to doctor. And, I mean, if you do look at these pictures, it's tragic. They look like two different people from before she really starts these exorcisms to right before her death. She clearly looks unwell. And again, it's hard when you're talking about parents and their children, but we're talking about kneecaps that are broken, dehydration. And you see that she's doing things like drinking her own urine. There are ways to get water in the body, for example. And even though medical intervention was sought at first, it seemed like all the attention then focused on just the exorcisms, which we know that especially if you have chronic conditions like epilepsy, you probably can't just stop treating them midway through, right? Like you may not cure the epilepsy, but you can't treat it for two years and be like, well, still have epilepsy. Let's just stop treatment now. That's not usually how chronic conditions work. Certainly not with infections like pneumonia. Now this trial, as you can imagine, was a sensation for many reasons. But one of the major ones was the issue of science and reason versus religion. Germany was regarded as highly rational and secular in comparison to many other European nations. And exorcisms were very rare in the country, so the citizens were captivated by this trial where exorcisms were obviously not only the defense's theory, but at the center of this entire case. Not wanting to appear that they considered possession by the devil as a legitimate defense, the German officials attempted to downplay the possession aspect as much as possible, but regardless, many of the audio recordings of the exorcisms were played throughout the trial as evidence, and you can imagine just how sensational that would be. Another thing that added to the sensationalism of the trial was that they had Annalise's body exhumed shortly before the trial began. Why would they do this? Well, there was a nun who had a vision that Annalise's body was incorrupt in the grave, which would have added further evidence that she was truly possessed. So there's this idea that, and I think there are documents of this, where instead of following the normal decay of the body, if the body had some like supernatural possession, whether it be good or bad, that somehow it's incorrupt, right? Like it doesn't decay. It looks as if the person is just sleeping, even though they've been dead for days, weeks, months. And so this nun is like, no, there's proof that she really was possessed by demons because her body's incorrupt. It's not decaying as it should be in the ground. So they exhume her body. And what do you know? When she was exhumed, it was clear that her body had just followed the natural course of decomposition. It was not incorrupt. It was as you would expect a body that's been in the ground for some time. Yeah. So by April 1978, this trial is coming to an end. And all four defendants would be found guilty, but not of the original charge, of a lesser charge of negligent manslaughter. Annalise's parents were fined and given six-month suspended prison sentences with probation for three years. And one defense that you have in Germany, which is like an interesting defense, is that you've suffered enough. You can actually say that as like in mitigation of your sentence. 
which I think makes sense. But so basically they were like, look, we suffered, we've suffered enough. We've lost our daughter. So therefore we should get less of a sentence. And pretty much everybody agreed with that. And that was what they received. But the priest would receive the same sentence and they didn't even have to pay the fines. And you would think they would be a little bit more responsible than anyone else. Now, many in the public thought these sentences were nothing compared to what they had done, but it was actually more severe than what the prosecutor was seeking. The prosecutor had taken the position that the parents shouldn't have anything happen to them. They should just be convicted, acknowledge that this happened, but they had suffered enough, and the priest should just have to pay a fine. But the presiding judge, Elmer Bolander, delivered the verdict stating that Annalise had died of advanced emaciation, which could have been prevented if she had been given proper medical attention as late as 10 days before her death. So even though it was a light sentence, he thought he was doing something at least a little bit more significant than what the prosecutor had even wanted. And I think both what the prosecution is asking for, which is a relatively light sentence, and though the judge gives them a harsher sentence than was asked for, but really a relatively light sentence. No one really went to prison, right? I think all of this shows you that this this whole case really does have more to do and the tensions that we have in terms of like what are the lines between science and religion when you don't really have evidence that either the priests or the parents were like out to get Annalise, right? Like there's no indication that they've been beating their daughter for years and this was just another element of the abuse. It you can see how a jury would be kind of torn in terms of how much of this is criminal and what part of like the public life goes into the home life. So fast forward 35 years, June 6th, 2013, the home Annalise died in burned to the ground. Police determined that this was the work of an arsonist, but many people believed the arsonist was in fact the spirit of Annalise destroying the place where once she had suffered so much torment. Why it took her 35 years? Not entirely sure. Probably she's just an arsonist. But you can see why people might think that. So there was other evidence of possessions. We'll kind of tick through them since that's kind of the center of all of this, whether she was actually possessed. So according to Annalise's mother, one night the family was eating dinner and Annalise's hands swelled up to a huge size. And Annalise cried out, I have black hands, my savior, forgive me. Now, as this occurred, she claimed to be able to see diabolic faces on the wall and she described them as having seven crowns and seven Horns. On a separate incident, her mother noted that when Annalise was standing in front of a statue of the Virgin Mary, her eyes went completely black. Father Rents and Annalise's mother recalled that she was frequently thrown to the floor with great force, and each time Annalise would get up onto her knees and recite the Hail Mary. And this happened so often that Annalise began sleeping on the floor, which she continued to do for three years. Father Alt described Annalise's physical condition as her head and face were so bruised, they looked almost black. Her eyes were so swollen that one could hardly see them. She was so battered that it was impossible to recognize her. If those things are true, I think what those show, at least to me, are that I do think that her mother at least wanted to believe she was demon-possessed. And that whether it was confirmation bias, I mean, these priests like went and asked for special permission to exercise this girl. So there's already going to be some like tendency to want to be right, right? It sounds like whether these things happened or not, I think they did believe they happened. Now, whether that is reason enough to ignore the very obvious physical things that she could have been saved from, like dehydration and malnutrition is another question. But Take it for what you are. If these things were all true, do you think it's a demon possession? As a result of Annalise's death in the, in the trial, many German priests actually had a problem with this. They wanted to distance themselves from what happened and what they considered to be old-fashioned practices. They pointed to the fact that the rite of exorcism, the Roman rite, was dated back to 1614. And so they advocated for modernizing the church's rules surrounding exorcisms. In 1984, they petitioned the Vatican to change their approach by, instead of addressing the demon directly, they wanted to address 
the patient. I almost treat this more like a psychological thing than a demonic thing. The church reviewed this. I spent about 15 years reviewing these proposals and denied them in 1999. There have been some changes made to the right, some protections put in place, but it remains largely the same. Now, Annalise's grave site in Klinningburg has become a pilgrimage site. In fact, buses of pilgrims flock to the site. They view Annalise as a legitimate sufferer of some sort of demonic possession and someone who fought against not only demons, but also the sort of idea of increased secularism. And there was this notion that Annalise was somehow a representative of a corrupt youth. You know, it's the 60s and 70s, so you can imagine. So a lot of these people still do this, and she's kind of become something of an unofficial saint to groups of people in Europe. Now, despite her condition, this is something that's interesting. Annalise had a boyfriend for years named Peter. And during rare moments of lucidity, Annalise and Peter would spend time planning for their future together once all this was behind them and she was well. And I only wish that that could have happened. There was a you know, there was a possibility for something brighter for her, and it's just unfortunate that things went the way they did. So let's dive into theories. What was this? Was this a medical ailment? Was it in her head? Was it in her parents' head? Or was she demon-possessed? So let's start with something that we know she had a diagnosis for, epilepsy. It's entirely possible that much of everything Annalisa suffered was just the result of her epilepsy diagnosis in combination with her highly religious upbringing. Epilepsy was not fully understood back when Annalise was diagnosed. And we know that there is a form of epilepsy that is resistant to medication. I think even today, there's really very much that is unknown about epilepsy. And a lot of epilepsy, people with very severe epilepsy, can't properly be treated. They try lots of different medications, but it kind of keeps some serious things at bay, but it doesn't certainly doesn't cure it. And you can imagine with either the mixture of drugs that they didn't know how to exactly use to them not having any problems with it, to her just wanting some relief. I can't imagine being stuck in a body where she is just constantly sick. And then remember that six month period in the hospital where she was ostracized and mocked by other patients, you know, people who are in a lot of ways similar to her condition, but even among them, she is an outcast. She has already suffered so much and is in this state of being trapped quite physically in her own mind, in her own body. And it could be that all of these things just flowed from that devastating diagnosis. And look, I think if you're looking for the Occam's razor, this is it. You know, she was diagnosed with epilepsy well before there was any indication that she was possessed by demons. So to me, if you're going to make the Occam's razor argument... You have someone who is suffering from a severe, it's a mental illness, but a physical mental illness as well. They start showing more and more severe symptoms. The most logical explanation is this is a manifestation of their epilepsy. Not that they both have epilepsy and Adolf Hitler is possessing them. So another theory, though, is martyrdom syndrome. That might explain some of her strange behavior because she definitely does turn a corner at some point and start to act stranger and stranger, starts hearing things, smelling things. She begins to smell, right? And this syndrome is defined by the need to seek out suffering due to some psychological need. And in regards to religion, this can manifest itself as an extreme form of penance out of love and duty towards others. So oftentimes it can lead to self-harm, even though the subject of it, the person doing it, doesn't recognize it as self-harm, isn't trying to actually hurt themselves, but is trying to bring upon suffering for themselves to show how much they love. This is not that out of the ordinary, right? We We've seen like, dramatic displays of love and romantic especially in 1980s comedies right where guys trying to you know i don't know the brat pack trying to impress jennifer gray or whatever or falls to their knees to like tear their clothes off like i will do anything for you take that to an extreme though in terms of maybe religion and also think about the breaking of the kneecaps like i want this so badly I will even break my kneecaps and continue to kneel on them to say the Hail Mary to show just how committed I am to whatever it is. 
right? Now, this would make sense because Annalise was raised in a very religious household. I'm not saying every religious household leads to this, but trying to understand where this may have come from. We know that she always had a deep interest in religious matters, and she was an excellent theology student, and she immersed herself in Christian literature. She also had a deep fascination with a female saint named Barbara Wiegand, who Annalise may have seen a lot of herself in. Again, let me note, doesn't mean that if you're from a religious household or you're raised in a religious household, you're going to have martyrdom syndrome. I think paired with the fact that she had a very delicate mental state and a lot of physical ailments, this all paired together may have been the perfect Petri dish of what we ended up seeing. But of course, there's another possibility, and that's that Annalise was in fact possessed by demons. And there are many people who still believe to this day that Annalise is a real example of demonic possession and that she was murdered, but not by her parents and not by the priest, but by these demons that refused to leave her at least while she was still alive. So that is the story of Annalise Michelle. It is one that has become famous. It is one that has generated a Hollywood film. And we'll be watching that one. I hope you guys will join us, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. And I hope that while you are watching that movie and you're enjoying it and the, it's a scary movie, it's a horror classic now, remember the truth behind it and remember the suffering that Annalise went through. And I think at the end of the day, does it even really matter what exactly it was that killed her? I think the thing to remember is that this poor girl did suffer horribly and that she died in this horrific state. And don't forget about her. And even when you are, and we have a lot of fun in October. We have a lot of fun with Halloween. We have a lot of fun with horror movies. But just remember, there's real people behind this. When we talk about this, we talk about true crime. And it's true when you have stories like this. There are real people behind this who suffered. And the last thing we should ever do is forget about those people and the real suffering that they experienced. Well, guys, we hope you've enjoyed this episode. I want you to shoot us an email, prosecutorspod at gmail.com. If you have any sort of demonic stories that you would like to share, we'd love to hear them. Check us out on Twitter and all your social media, Facebook, TikTok, everything, at Prosecutors Pod. Join the gallery and join our movie watching experience. We'd love to have you there. And thank you to all our patrons who are joining us for October episodes in September. This is the third October episode, and it's like the fourth day of September. So, you know, that makes sense. <laughs> it's it's like Brett's dream. <laughs> exactly. It's October all, all year round. So we're having a good time with it. And we've still got two episodes to go. So Whoa. looking forward to those as well. Well, Alice, is there anything else you want to say before we sign off? No, this was just a sad case. That's all. It, it is a sad case. And I think this is an interesting case because we obviously did an exorcism episode before that I really do think <laughs> was an exorcism. The Roland Doe case, if you haven't heard it, thoroughly freaked me out. So go listen to that. That's what the movie The Exorcism is based off of. And it's interesting to see the kind of the juxtaposition and that you can't just throw around the term exorcism loosely to cover all of these. You might have to look a little bit deeper. Okay. Well, guys, we're about to sign off, but we're not actually done here. Because while I think it's obvious, I don't know what Alice's position is on this, but I think for me, I, I don't think this is an exorcism. I mean, I think most of you who are listening, or it was an exorcism, but I don't think it's actually a demon possession. But, and I think most of you listening probably feel the same way, and you haven't really seen a lot of evidence that this was a possession. But there is one piece of evidence that we have not yet shared with you, that we've mentioned it. These exorcisms were recorded, and we have the audio. In fact, you can go listen to hours of this audio online. We're not going to give you hours, but after we sign off, before the music starts, we're going to play a couple minutes of these exorcisms, and you can hear it for yourself, and you can judge for yourself. So let us know what you think about that. It's, it's some intense stuff. I'll say that. If you want to if you want to end now, I'll understand, but... I was going to say, I'll end now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you're listening on Patreon right now, we're not going to play it. You're going to have to listen to the actual episode to hear this. So that's coming up. But for us, the day has ended. We'll be back next week. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. 
and we are the prosecutors. I was like, please don't play it. Please. <laughs> <laughs> I can't handle it. <laughs> Even though I don't think it's an exorcism, I still can't handle it. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. It's horrific no matter what, right? I mean, it's it, either right. an exorcism exactly. or someone in the depths of a mental break of immense Absolutely. Power. So it's 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 a, it's hor it's horrific to listen to. Yeah. Have you ever that's why seen I'm and that, at the end, That's a really great that. point. Have you ever seen someone have a seizure? It's terrifying. Like it's it if there were ever a demon possession, I think it would look like that. I was in college and I was at a restaurant and I was like waiting to check out and someone just like had a you know epileptic episode in front of me and it was terrifying I know there are lots of different ways to have an epileptic episode but like it looked terrifying and there were not very many people around you know to help out I didn't know what to do I love reality TV on Pluto TV. Same, and I love that it's free. It gives me the freedom to watch Bravo's Real Housewives Vault Channel. I'm totally free to watch Bad Girls Club. I'm free for Jersey Shore. Love and hip hop, I'm free all day. Survivor, I'm free all night. With hundreds of free reality shows, you are totally free to watch what you love on Pluto TV. Pluto TV, stream now, pay never.